Tesla just released yet another video of the Tesla bot, this time without his clothes or maybe a better way to say it, his armor. In any case, for many people, they have serious doubts that the bot can work long enough between charges, that the bot will not be strong enough to do useful work. Well, today we have a Tesla bot expert here who is going to show you a video of how Optimus can lift a grand piano. And we're going to show you how many shifts the bot can do in a day. And that expert, of course, everybody knows is Dr. Scott Walter. He's founded two robotics companies in the past, and we've been doing a number of videos on the Tesla bot. So let's go and uh, crush some FUD here. Scott, how are you doing? Yeah. Good, Herbert. And I guess you want to go through my power post, huh? You, you call it a power post and see why you did that, because it's a very long post, but we're going to highlight the key things that you have been hearing from people who just doubt a lot. And you're saying first principles thinking. Let's stop, start with that. Let's start with a bot runtime. How long can Optimus work between charges? What's your answer to that? Yes. So the first thing I want to do is, is address some of the FUD that was out there thinking that uh, the bots will only be able to, to work about an hour and then they need to be recharged. And the, the Tesla bot has been designed to be able to function for eight hours. And it's a pretty simple, straightforward calculation you can do on that. One is that we know the size of the battery pack and we know what the, the maximum run rate is, which would be 500 watts um, sustained. And based on that battery pack, we'd be able to last a little bit over four hours. But you're saying, aha, see, you can't do eight hours. But that's sustained maximum if it was like walking, doing something heavy. But the average consumption rate is expected to be around 250, maybe 300 watts, something like that. And that would get you through an eight-hour day from 100% down to close to 0%. But there are some certain strategies that can be employed to make sure the bot can actually run continuously without completely draining its batteries to make sure it's able to make it to these shifts without having to do a full recharge. So I wanted to analyze those things and break it down. So one of the first arguments was that the uh, the compute alone was going to just drain the batteries completely. You wouldn't have enough for that. And that's definitely a bit of a canard because we all have laptops and we all know our laptops are able to run several hours with a battery pack that's nowhere near the size of what's inside of Optimus. And so if you are looking, if you're trying to make the argument from that standpoint that the compute is going to use it up, that's not going to work because the compute in Optimus is actually a lot simpler than when you have in a laptop because it doesn't have to, it doesn't have a display that has to be running YouTube videos. It doesn't have to be making Zoom calls. It's not trying to do email or anything else. And it, and it doesn't have all this bloatware and other operating system kind of stuff that's going in there. It is a bespoke operating system specifically for Optimus, which is designed to not be power hungry. And of course we know that what that is. That's the inference engine. That's the FSD chip that's designed to not be power hungry because it's also going into EVs like the Tesla and wants to make sure it is parsimonious when it comes to the amount of energy it needs to be able to do these calculations. So that is not going to be running or using up that much energy. What's going to be using up the energy are the actuators. Now we know the Optimus actuators are pretty powerful. In fact, Tesla released a video um, a little bit over a year ago around AI Day 2 showing exactly how powerful the actuators are that are in the leg of, of the bot, the hamstring actuator. And it's a pretty impressive video because you can see that that actuator is able to lift a grand piano, a half ton grand piano. Yeah. A half ton grand piano is about 500 kilograms. And we can see that video of it doing it. And the first thing I want to ask you, and I think you, you know the answer, but I just want to ask you anyways, and people in the audience is like, how much power do you think it need, is needed to be able to lift that grand piano at the speed that we're doing and thinking about, you know, how power hungry some of the things are in your house. So for instance, yeah, your blow dryer, when you plug it into your 110 outlet, the maximum right. it can do is 1500 Watts and that's it. Yeah. Then the circuits kind of blown. So just imagine, okay, blow dryer and the amount of energy's coming out of blow dryer. And grand piano, that's pretty heavy, isn't it? It's that's like, very heavy. That's yeah. going to be a lot of energy. So let's sit yeah. there and first principles and actually look at the physics of, of the weight and the speed and work out the formulas and what's the number you come up with herbert do you have a, have a number in your head <laughs> i have no idea power wise but yeah if you're telling me that if a uh, hair dryer is 1500 it's, watts yeah, it's going to be yeah. 10 times minimum probably 100 times more than that because a hair dryer does not do anything it's just blowing hair yeah, and heating it up the, like. it's just heating up you just heating yeah, up very that it seems yeah. like that. 1500 watts okay it only needs 183 watts to lift the grand uh -huh. piano Okay, 183 watts. That's less than 200 watt light bulbs, which is something we're all familiar with. So you're seeing that going up and down. 
it's not power hungry. It's able to do a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And it's not just because that thing is incredibly efficient, like that's simple physics. That's what you learn in physics 101. You've got a certain mass that's being lifted at a certain velocity over, you know, a certain distance. And that's it. Yeah. You know, you calculate how long it takes to move that. Like it looks like uh, maybe two inches or something like that. And does it take two yeah. seconds? And it's moving at an inch a second. Then you just Pretty multiply fast. that by the mass and gravity. Yeah. And bam, you get a number like 183. So let's call it 200 watts. All right. That means the battery pack has enough energy in it to continuously lift that grand piano for 12 hours. Mm. Okay. Or enough energy to lift it 200 and I think 85 meters. The other thing about that battery pack, it's about one thirtieth the size of a model Y, which means it has enough energy in it to make your model Y go 10 miles at highway speeds. There's a lot of energy in there. So, I mean, this whole idea that it doesn't have, like, there's enough, there's enough to go in there. So then you can start looking at these different calculations. Like it's designed to be efficient in order to do these movements of these motors. It's not as power hungry as you may think. That is amazing. Yeah. That I like the way you did that. So the, just, if you look at the car, it's being driven by these batteries and then, um, it can drive a friggin' car, right? It can drive yes. a car, it can accelerate really fast. It can, uh, you know, stop and all that so and the weight of that so you you said it was one thirtieth the size of the battery of the tr the car but what's yeah, the weight yeah. difference what's the weight difference okay so it, it's going to be about the same so you have uh, about 75 kilowatt hours uh in a model y and you've got 2.3 and so you just kind of put it in there and you just do the math and it's like that's oh, about one thirtieth of that so so no, it has one thirtieth the number of batteries and so the weight is about 10 car. kilograms so on the car the batteries yeah i'm talking yes. about the weight of a oh the, oh, the, the car, car is car very heavy first, yeah. yeah what what is it the, the car is is like is it four thousand pounds or something like that three, yeah somewhere yeah. between three and four thousand pounds it's pretty heavy and the yeah. full battery pack is like also in the, the order of about i think okay. a quarter of that so it's close to a thousand pounds and in the case of um of optimus the the the, the weight of the the batteries that are in there is uh, around kilogram 10 kilograms is, okay. is going to be the maximum. So let's, let's uh, recap what you just said here. So, so mm -hmm. first, first of all, you said that these actuators um, is, are, are not power hungry. So let's just review what you said mm -hmm. here, number one. The, power, the actuators are not power hungry. You showed that it can actually do a grand piano and it's only 183,000 watts. 183, 183 watts. watts. 100, yeah. 183 watts. That. So that's less than two light bulbs. Yeah. Okay, standard 100 watt light bulbs. Then you're saying- For those who remember the, them. Yeah, Optimus can operate for eight hours. That's what your suggestion, and we'll we'll walk through the number of shifts mm -hmm. that you think it can do. But that's you know, battery pack cannot support the compute, let alone actuators. And you explained that that is not the case. Correct. And then the third here is Optimus is defying the laws of physics. Can you explain this? And says Mercedes tried that argument regarding the semi, <laughs> and of course that didn't age well. And I think actually even um, uh, Bill Gates said it's just not possible for the semi for those batteries to power the semi. But don't just take Tesla's word for it. You said Agility, Sanctuary, Figure, Aptronic, Unitry, Fourier, all these other humanoid bot, robot vendors, even with smaller battery packs, they are announcing that they can do at least three to four hours of operation. So we're pretty confident that it can do at least eight hours. Yes, yes. Be because part of the argument is don't trust the numbers that Tesla is giving you. It's like, okay, yeah. don't. Go, go ahead and, and look somewhere else. And again, you know, do the first principles kind of calculations and get an idea of what's going on. In, in what the capabilities are. And, um, you know, I had other people also kind of look at it and say, yeah, if you look how much energy it takes for a human to run a marathon or something like that, it's also about the same as the energy that's in the, in the battery pack. So we know physically you can do some very demanding things. The human body is very efficient in many ways. It's also very inefficient in other ways. So the, um, the, the power requirements that it has is not going to be as extreme as everyone thinks. And yes, the battery pack is not as big as the battery pack on a Model Y, but it's also not as heavy as a Model Y. It's yeah. also not trying and to go 70 miles per hour. You don't have to drag coefficients and all these other things. So it's amazing it, it, it's too possible. that the batteries are inside the body now. Uh, before, when we look at other uh, bots, you'll see that there's a big, like a, they're carrying a backpack. There's a massive yes. battery in the back. So it's in there. Okay, can you show this to, this this new video that they dropped? I haven't had a chance to talk to you about it, but um, you know, they took out the covering 
I'm wondering yes. why they're doing that. I guess they're just trying to really carefully, you, you notice that there's motion capture so that they're actually capturing yes. the, the movement, but look how thin it really is. I mean, it's really tiny inside. So you're telling me that that, that is just so tiny. Yes. It's now, so thin. The, yes, it, it is. And it's, it's deceiving when you see uh, it with its armor. And of course yeah. you've seen a lot of the other bots also without their armor and they also look kind of skinny. And I was wondering, it's like, wow, you know, what's the difference between there? Why is the Tesla bot so heavy? And you see, it's not really. And as we start to look at the actuators, it looks like they really have slimmed them down compared to the original designs. Mm -hmm. So they really are lighter and tighter, which is good to see. I was surprised to see that they would reveal that much because Elon was complaining about the frame by frame analysis that the competition was making on that. And I was wondering why would it be walking around without its armor? And in some ways, there's a little bit of a flex going on here that someone pointed out. I think it was Wes that pointed this out to me. He said, look around there in that very large, what is a motion capture area. There is no lanyard on the bot. It's walking without any protection. Mm -hmm. And there are no scuff marks or any signs of damage that the bot has fallen on. What it means is they are confident that they can let the bot walk now and it's not going to fall down. I would leave the armor on there. I mean, it's not clothing. It's, it's in a sense, it's a, it's a kind of armor to protect it when it falls. And you are not seeing any scuff marks or anything else anywhere else around there, which is like an interesting insight. The other thing is that there are motion capture dots on there. There's one of those things. This is, uh, I referred to it as Scotoma, is that John Gibbs and I were looking at it for 35 minutes and mm -hmm. we were kind of noticing the dots on there and not connecting the dots and realizing that those <laughs> motion capture dots until we looked at the frame around there and everything and took a close up of everything. And then it was like, yes, there are motion capture dots all over the place. Now, the thing is, the motion capture dots you probably want on something that's very rigid. And in some cases, probably on pieces of the bot that are moving internally that is being covered up by the covers. So if you want to track the movement of those actuators that are in there with the dots, you need to uncover them. And you'd also like them to be very rigid. And the covers can have a little bit of wobble in there. So they're using the motion capture to compare that with their simulation data and probably their telerobotic data as part of the feedback loop in the training. So that is a reason why the motion capture is there and probably why you're not seeing the armor. Now, everyone might be thinking, yeah, but you know, the, the armor is, is on there. Um, uh, you know, is, is added weight or something like that. Now there's hardly any weight. So it's, it's not like they're trying to reduce how heavy the bot is to be able to do this. A lot of it, I think is because they really need to have those things exposed in order to do the, the proper motion capture to understand what the real structure yeah. is doing when it moves. I have a theory just by looking at this and you tell me if I'm right. The last time that we talked, the last mm -hmm. time that uh, they 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 showed the Gen Two. By the way, let me show you. Let me show you what that looks like. Here, this is September twenty two. This is what it would look like. Very bulky, very big, heavy. It looks really mm -hmm. heavy. And then now this is the Gen, uh, Gen Two. And then you saw that even without its armor, it's even thinner. It's even you know so sweet and you know just beautiful. My theory about why they're doing this is that the last time that they showed the Gen 2, what happened was the, uh, was it Milan Kovac said mm -hmm. that, um, that, you know, that they're able to now use end-to-end -end neural network for everything. They showed you the bot, the, the this, this demo that they did, and this was training it using a neural bot. But he said that the lower limbs were not yet end-to-end. -end. And this looks to me, like maybe they're testing to see an end-to-end -end neural network, which is meaning to say even the lower limbs are now moving based on those videos that they fed it and it's knowing that. Do you think that it's case and do you, can you see it's how much smoother it's walking than it before? Remember, it used to always look like it's about to take a dump, as everybody kept saying. Yes, and uh, I'm glad you brought it up because you were the first one to kind of notice that. So you should get the credit for having mm -hmm. mentioned that it probably is using end-to-end -end now, whereas before it was not. Uh, and that might explain why the walking velocity is a little bit slower than what we saw mm -hmm. in the Gen 2. So in the Gen 2, I estimated that as around 1.2 miles per hour. This one seems to be about 0.9 miles per hour. And the only sort of explanation for that difference would probably come down to maybe they're using a completely different walking algorithm and they're just starting to get it to go. And it's mm -hmm. just going to only improve from there. So they're getting the training data. 
Um, one other thing I sort of noticed by taking oh. the armor off mm -hmm. is, you know, we already noticed that you don't see the cabling, how, how well the cabling is housed. And you can say, oh, yeah, but it's probably a rat's nest behind all, all the covers. Even without the covers, the cabling is not a mess. It's yeah. still very nice and tight. Very it's, clean. it's really well in there. Yeah. The other thing, as you start to look at it, remember, Elon referred to Optimus as a product three times yep. in the earning call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This doesn't look like a prototype to me anymore. This is starting no, to look a little not. bit more like a product. It, it's like, oh, like it's sure. getting very, very close to what they want that, that final yeah. design to be. Let me show you something else I just noticed right now. Um, here's the bot walking. And you see how it's walking. It's not really moving its hips. Mm -hmm. Take a look at it. Take a look at it again. So it's just just walking straight, and you see the hips yes. don't seem like they're moving. They're just they're just pretty well straightforward. Okay, and let's take a look again. Look at that. It's just straight, right? Now mm -hmm. maybe I'm seeing things, but look at this. This one here looks like the hips are swaying back and forth as it's moving. You're getting yes, you're getting a little bit that? more sway. Yes, yes. Yeah. You see that? That's yes. what I think is the difference between a neural net versus a coded situation. It's knowing yes. the, you know, just like us, when you, when you put your foot down, you're going to put that hip down to the right a little bit, just to make it easier for you to walk. Anyways, I just. And just yeah, that's, that's very important, not only for balance, but also um, motion efficiency. So that's going to improve even a little bit more, the, the unlocking of the hips, getting yeah. that, that sway in there, getting a little bit arm, more arm motion in there as well will help with the velocity as well as the, the heel to toe. So they are probably just using some new strategy right now for the walking. We're beginning to see a little bit of it and we have the benefit of not only witnessing that, but seeing parts of Optimus that yeah. we weren't expecting to see before that confirms what I th sort of thought about what the joint designs are, that they really haven't changed that much. They've been cleaned up. So they don't have any, any new kind of shoulder design. It's the same old design. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just much cleaner. The only thing I can't tell for sure is how the elbow is being done because everything is just so blurry. There's nothing in there to say it's changed from what it was, but I can't kind of confirm that it's still doing the same thing because it's just, it's very hard to tell, but I'm pretty sure they're still using a linear actuator. There's a chance they flipped it around a little bit. The lever arm might be in a different location, but I just can't get high enough resolution image anywhere. I'm going to be going mm -hmm. through again and again to try to find it to see if I confirm whether they changed something a little bit. Because you remember the padding that they put in is like a lot of padding in the front elbow. And there's still a little bit in the back, that black padded area. And mm -hmm. I couldn't understand why it would be so big. And the only way yes. it would be really big is if the mechanism is more on the top of right. the or in the inside there. part of the elbow rather there than the bottom, which is where it was before. So yeah. I, yeah. So padding. right there, you yeah. see a big black patch there, and there's very little in the back. So yeah, it's hard to tell. And that's that's the so next right, thing I want to do is try to dig in and figure that out. Okay. And then the other thing is, um, so this photo that you're sharing here, this is all the motion capture cameras that you noticed. Mm -hmm. These are cameras. Yeah, those are, those, are the, those are the balls. So those are basically the reflective yeah. balls that the cameras are able to pick up. And okay. so they're at known yes. locations and they track those known locations. Yeah. And now they can compare those known locations with what's in the model to see what the error is. And that is their loss function for the training. So that's why I'm thinking that's what it is. Basically, they're testing now the walking, they're using motion capture, they're doing neural network training, and that's mm -hmm. what they're doing now. So this is great news. This was the last remaining piece that we were waiting for, was whether or not the bot can actually be end-to-end -end neural net, everything from the brains, of course, the hand manipulation that they showed that they can train it, but everybody's going, well, they still can't do the walking end-to-end. -end. I bet you that that's what it's referring to now. So like you said, it looks clean. So let's go through your productivity estimate. Um, you think, yes. you said here that maximum bot productivity, the longest workday possible. Okay. So in a previous post, it was shown that 16 hour bot factory and work. I'm not, see, I'm not seeing the post yet. Did you uh, put it oh, up? Oh. Sorry. Yeah. In a previous post, it was shown that a 16 hour bot factory workday is possible just by leveraging standard break schedules, only using a battery pack. No umbilical cord, no swappable battery packs, no induction pad charging. Right. So you were saying, okay, it's probably 16 day. However, what is the maximum workday possible? The bot needs to charge after all. So what is the optimum charge schedule to minimize disruptions to production? The break schedule is the optimum since it's already used to accommodate to humans. 
and bots and humans will work side by side. 16 hour day is typically a two shift schedule for longer day, a three shift model. Okay, go ahead. Explain the rest. Okay, so so we, we looked at a couple models. There was also a previous post to that where I was able to demonstrate pretty easily that you can get a 16-hour workday out of the bot. And this is kind of important because CERN has been trying to model these different things on, on how much value you can get out of the bot. And is it just an eight-hour day? Is it 16 you know, what's the maximum that's possible? And we want to look at it. And again, looking at just purely a battery pack. Yes, there's going to be other strategies with umbilical cords and everything else. But just imagine we have a situation that, eh, you, you know, induction pads aren't going to work. The, you know, you really can't have an umbilical cord in there because it's, it's moving around a lot. And it's maximum drain. It, it's 500 watts is what it's doing. How would you be able to get a 16-hour day out of it without it having to take these really long extended breaks to get charged? Now, initially, for the foreseeable future, the bots are not going to replace all the workers in a factory the factory is still going to be scheduled around the humans and you're going to have the breaks. You're going to have meal times. You're going to have scheduled breaks between in, in the morning and the afternoon and everything else. And so I looked at what is a typical schedule. So normally you have a mid morning break of about 15 minutes, half hour for lunch, half hour in the afternoon, and then you have a between shift. So it's like, okay, if the, if the humans have to take the break, that means the line is basically going to come to rest. It's just going to idle by itself because the bots are constantly being fed the next thing to work on. And if a human was doing that upstream, the bot's suddenly going to be starved. It's going to sit there and do nothing. Or it's going to finish something and try to move it down and it can't move because the next operation is a human operation. And now the pallet can't go in there. So the bots are going to be idled if the humans are still in there. So if we take advantage of that, is it possible? And that's what we were able to show is that at maximum drain, this is the worst case, comfortably, 16 hour day, no problem, with lots of margins. I mean, I mean, a lot in there. And then we said, okay, how can we make this a little bit tougher? And one of them is to look at the charging infrastructure. So the first thing is you have to remember the battery packs, you just can't bring it to a supercharger and say, yeah, that thing's gonna charge, you know, in in like two minutes. If you look at, you know, the, the capacity of the battery and what you can deliver, it's like, no, no, no. The batteries can only take so much. So I, I talked to uh, to Jordan GCD of the limiting factor to say, for that size battery pack, what's really the maximum? And he says, somewhere between mm -hmm. seven and eight kilowatts. Mm -hmm. And that is basically level two charging that you can have in your home. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's that's something you can do with, you know, like a, a 220 line or something like that to get up there, two, 220, maybe 30 amps or something like that. So I said, okay, let's look at this, those different scenarios. So yeah, if you have like a maximum drain of 500 and your charging infrastructure is like a 110, 12 amp, you won't be able to during those breaks to be able to charge it up fast enough because the charge is going to be too slow. But what factory only has 110? I mean, they get 220, 380s, they got plenty of it all over the place. So mm -hmm. you don't need a full level to charging. You can go mm -hmm. at like 220, um, uh, 12 amps or even 24 amps. That's more than enough during those breaks to top it off. And then I also said, nope, the bot can't, you can't charge above 90% because you know that last 10% takes forever. So we're gonna always be in there and you always have more than enough reserve. You never get down below like 15 or 20% of the battery capacity before you get the next boost to do it. Very easy to do. And that's in a two shift mode where you have like, you know, a decent break between it and you may have like a lot of time in the early mornings of the hour to like charge your bot back up to 100%. When you go to the yeah. three shift, and that's what yeah. I think I show a couple of the graphs there. It gets a bit tight there because at that point, if you want to get 22 hours of operation and you really are a three shift, which means the humans are in there. I mean, those humans aren't getting a whole lot of break time in there either. <laughs> so they get, they get maybe a 10 minute rather than a 15 minute break. And they might get like a 20 or 25 minute um, meal time uh, in there. And there's like no time between the breaks, which is almost unprecedented because you need a pretty good gap between your shifts in order for to get all the humans out of the factory and the next wave of humans in the factory. There's always going to be that changeover. So we narrowed it down as closely as possible. So 20 hours is very easy to do. 21 hours is also um, so let me Let me explain this. So, so 20, but this is 20, uh, yeah. yes. A 20 hour shift, you're saying here, 2100 yep. uh, watts per hour. So, so we're starting hitting, not at 100%. So the, yeah, you're the not orange line at the top is yeah. full. And so yeah. we're coming in there. And the reason is because you have to remember you're picking up from the end of the, of the last shift. So you want to, you want to sure. do this 24 seven, right? Okay. So, so those levels are about the same. Yeah. It so eight o'clock in the morning, down. right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. It drops down to uh, by 10 o'clock, two hours yep. later, it runs to the five, yep. uh, seven, eight, eight looks like a thousand Watts here. Then, yep. then, then, uh, you charge it. No, you charge it. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, so yep. you're charging. I thought this was during the meal break. The meal break's right well, here. Well, though. during the red, that that's your short break. That That's your, your midday break minute. or your early morning break, which is like Just 10 or 15 minutes. 10, yes. 15, it could pop up yep. here, and then it use yep. it again. And then during a 30-minute break, is that an hour or 30 minutes? Looks like yeah, it's that's 30, 30 minutes, minutes now. So it's 30, 30 minutes. Yep. Okay, and then it works again for three hours, uh, 15, just a quick 15 minute, 10 minute break, whatever, boom. Yep. And then uh, what's this one? End, the end and of the shift. The end of shift, people, which is, I think shift, also maybe, like another, maybe a 15, 15 or 20 minute, minute between shift. Yep. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So that's how this works. Yeah. And so it's going up and down as it breaks. So that looks like it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. 12, 12 charges in a yep. full 24 hour day. And, and and you're keeping it within the zone that you want it to be because you don't really want yeah. to go to hundred percent for, for bad recycling and you don't want to go down too low. So we never, in that case, we don't even get below 500 watt hours in yeah. there, which means we yeah. have more than an hour at maximum. And if you just uh, now we have a high supercharger. If I wanted to make that smaller and I have a spreadsheet that accompanies this, if we make this, the charging speed less than seven kilowatts, which would be the maximum. And then make that go. Yeah, then we get down closer to like, um, you know, uh, down between three and, and 600 uh, in there is possible because we can't quite boost it up, but we can still make it through. But that infrastructure for charging is is very easy. It's going to be there. And you're probably not going to be draining at 500 the whole time. So it's like, let's look at the worst case. Is that possible? That's the worst case. 20 yeah. hours is easy. And then 21 hours. And then uh, you got that gets 22 tougher hours. Because shifts have to get smaller. And then yeah. 22 hours, the shifts get even tighter and tighter. And there's like almost no time in there. So basically that means for an eight hour shift, the workers mm -hmm. are only getting 40 minutes off. What's the difference between this one 22 hours. and this one? Yeah. Now that one was showing um, a really bad situation that let's just say we, because I wanted to show a failure. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, let, yeah. let's stop always showing the things being succeeded. We're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. 22 hours here only with a meal break. There's mm -hmm. no... Um, mid morning gotcha. or mid afternoon kind of break yeah. or the equivalence as you go through the day. So mm -hmm. what happens there is that you just can't get that boost. So you see the strategy is important to have that little bit of one, but again, mm -hmm. this is at a maximum of 500. If we say 400 is the average makes mm -hmm. it no problem. So, so you can run it depending upon the shifts, but yep. you're not going to be in many cases running a shift like that, where you don't have that small break in there. If there's going to be humans. Okay. So okay. the assumption is in the foreseeable future, you're going to be working side by side with human coworkers. And those are, they are going to impact the speed of the line and when the line slows down and when the bots are going to go on break. So we're, we're saying we're not going to have bot breaks. We're going to have human breaks that the bots take advantage of. And that will allow you to get that. And going forward, batteries are only going to get better. Other ways of, of, of charging is going to get better. So yeah, eventually you'll probably be able to get almost a 24 hour work day out of the bots. But right now, let's just kind of look at it in that way of how it's possible to do it. If you really need a 24 hour work day out of the bot, there's a couple of strategies that I talk about in uh, a tweet that I think, or a post that I just put out later today that is you know either swappable battery packs. Of course you could use umbilicals if you want to do something like that. But let's just, I said, that's off the table, no umbilicals, no in charge, induction charge. You could do swappable battery packs which we call a hot swap, or you could do what I call a bot swap. So hot swap yeah. or bot swap. Yeah. And, and the yeah, bot swap bot. is basically, you always have one bot that's getting charged. And, yeah. and when it's fully charged, it goes over, finds the one that's in the lowest state and replaces it right there and goes yeah. around. The only question is, is which is the better strategy? And the better strategy, of course, is the one that is the most economic. CERN's run a couple of numbers and he kind of disappointed me with his numbers and says, yeah, the swappable battery pack is better. And like, no, because I mean, Swappable battery packs are going to be much harder for the infrastructure and everything else. But he said that, unfortunately, that means you're always having one bot, which is not working. And there's the, like the, the lost productivity from that bot that they're, they're looking at, which is, but depending upon, you know, how we ramp everything up, sometimes just using the swappable bot will make more sense than doing swappable battery packs, because that's going to require a little bit more infrastructure and, and also a change to the bot design. Very interesting. So you and CERN have just really th th thrown this apart, really trying to understand how this is going to work. But you've proven that the bot is very light, as we saw here, super, super light. Um, it looks like that it's already, it's pretty, you know, pretty production ready. Um, just this alone, it has the power to lift a piano 
And then you basically just went and showed that even with the, um, even with, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, the, the, the shifts work. You can yes. actually, th what you were mm -hmm. trying to do was show it working and then the shift of the entire, um, what am I trying to say, right? You're trying to show that it can do the entire uh, shift, three hours. Entire That's like shift. a full time. It, That's following, a full Following time. the typical schedule. So it's yeah. coming in like a human worker. So no, but you're saying not just a human worker. Yeah, yeah. No, I know, but you're saying yeah. if if you want a one bot to work three shift, which is twenty four hours a day, mm -hmm. it can be done. But they have to act like a human, where they take a fifteen minute break here, a ten minute break, a thirty minute break, yes. a fifteen minute break, yes. a thirty minute. But if they do that, this can be done. And yes, so, it can be done with, without so changing obvious. anything. Three it, shifts. Remember. The, the idea is that the, the bot should almost be able to be plugged right in to replace a human without reconfiguring the workstation, without adding really any, a lot of complexity or additional infrastructure that's unnecessary. So you want to keep it as simple as possible. And then one of the things is like, well, we'll just keep on following the schedule the humans do. Eventually yeah, you're going like to say, once idea. I swapped out all my humans, I don't want to have the lunch break anymore. And then yes. we got to start talking about, okay, what's the other strategy to do that? And that's when the, like the hot swap, bot swap. Kind of ideas yeah. kind of come in there so we want everyone to see that this is what the pathway looks like and that there aren't that many factories that are running 24 7. i mean they're running two shifts usually we want to know that they're 16 hours um cern has been using like a 16 hour 20 hour kind of model and trying to figure out what the utility of the bot is to figure out what the valuation could be of having robots as a service going future so it's like a very important thing for us to nail down yes. of what is possible to use in it to make sure all the calculations are really conservative and realistic in that we're not doing anything. And since anything that let's say um, is going to compromise the model. And the first thing was to look at the, uh, the FUD that was out there saying that, Oh, there's no yeah. way they have enough power because the Boston dynamics bot only lasts one hour. It's like, okay, fine. You know, it's like, that's that particular design that works doesn't mean all bots are going to be that way. And it seems that, it is definitely possible when you break it down using, you know, ordinary kind of very simple back of the envelope calculations to be able to prove or disprove. And it seems to me it's well within it's well the realm within. of possibility that the oh. bots can do a full shift easily. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about the potential for bots, a battery swap, which I don't think that they're doing because, you know, you know, right. they're feeling about swapping batteries. They, they don't like it because Tesla has already announced before that a swapping of battery is, is not a smart this, uh, model because you always have an extra battery and that battery could be used in a bot, like you're saying. But yes. if you look at the back of the bot, does it look like that they could swap the battery if you just look there? And if you look at uh, here, you can see the back of the bot here. And does it look like you could swap the battery? I can't see that that's It's, it's not designed as a swappable pack. So it would not have to right be now. redesigned. And if yeah. it's... If it's if it's swappable from behind, then it might be difficult for the bot to swap itself, unless you know, it's like a special station that it backed into and got unplugged. Now, the thing about the, the swapping is like as soon as you take the battery, the, and there's a reason we want to call it hot swap. As soon as you unplug the bot, the bot now has no longer has any power and can't continue. It's just kind of, mm, and that's going to be it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's a couple of strategies. One is that maybe you plug into something else to give you some backup power while you're doing it. That's one. The other is you have two battery packs that you unplug one of them, plug an OLED in, and then plug that one out and do it. So you have two of them in there. But that adds more complexity, more mass, and everything else. And the other is you could have a tiny reserve battery built into the bot. Uh, and that gives you just enough power for it to be able to go through the swapping or if the, if the battery just dies suddenly, you know, be able to go to a charging station or something like that. So you make sure you have enough there to be able to pull out the battery pack, put it down, put the next one in, and then it would recharge off of that battery pack or something like that because it would be a small reserve. So those are possible ways of being able to do it. The question is, you now need to have racks for them to go into. So you need to have like the charging for that or... They need to get ferried off somewhere. I mean, there, there's all that kind of cost of, of that are thinking about it. So you could keep it locally at the workstation that, you know, you just put it on down there and it charges while you continue to work and you swap again. Ah, that means you've got to reconfigure the workstation a little bit because it wasn't there for the humans. So you got, you got to change that a little bit. And then, of course, there's the added costs. And CERN tried to run some of the numbers on there. And it, his feeling was like, well, while you're paying a lot for those extra batteries that aren't being used, you're also paying a lot for the the battery pack in the bot that's being recharged and the bot that's not being used. And it depends upon the ratio. So if 
the bots are doing like full drain. They've got about four hours of operation. That means, and they can charge, you know, you know, full charge, depending on in there, you know, maybe about an hour, you know, maybe there's some situations faster, but let's just say you can charge it back up in one hour. So that means for every four bots, you would need one bot that's charging. And then you would kind of stagger <laughs> Their, their, their battery levels and just keep on swapping around, you know, tap on the shoulder, you go get charged. I'm going to take your place. Or it's if it's terrible. running more of the average, yeah. then it could be that you would have uh, one extra bot for every eight, but either, but that means you always got one bot that's sitting idle. And we know it's yeah. like, Oh, we kind of hate the fact that's idle. And so CERN ran it a bunch of ways and he told me that, and I'm, I'm trying to come up and poke holes in his argument there to, to see why he's wrong, but I haven't been able to well, yet. And it's not going to trust his one numbers. One bot for every four, so for 20%, you know, if you want four bots working full time, three shifts each, you have to have buy one more bot. That's right. not bad. That's, 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 that's not, that's not too bad. In, in, in the worst case, you, you would have that. And, uh, okay. So you, you get the price of that. And, and if the, if the cost of the bot is, is low enough, it may be small, but then the cost of, of the battery packs you would have like for the others, you know, maybe it's a thousand dollars or five hundred dollars, something like that, for each of those that they're having. Yeah. So that's you know, with four bots, it's like four thousand in capital you're sitting around, plus a little bit of infrastructure. And if you can buy the bot for a little bit around the same, it's like so you can see the numbers are close, and it's just yeah. a question: is it worth the design, the redesign of the bot? Because that comes with cost as well. And so it might be a smaller battery pack because now you don't have as much room for the batteries because you have room for all these connectors and everything else that are going out, and the fact that you've got to get something you got to grab and and all that. That forces a redesign and it might change it because the battery pack is a little bit structural to the bot itself. It's mm -hmm. designed to add some of the rigidity and strength so you don't have to put it somewhere else. But now suddenly the battery, the, you know, they're no longer kind of structural. You've got to have an actual structure. So, so there's that, a lot of arguments yeah. of why you don't want to do it, but there's also yeah, some not. very equally valid arguments why you would. And I think it's going to be a case by case kind of situation that you're going to find situations where you need the swappable batteries for some reason. But there's going to be plenty of use cases where you can say, no, we're perfectly fine with that. And other use cases, we can say, we, you know, the umbilical, that makes perfect sense, um, as, yeah. as well as induction charging. So all of those are possibilities. But I think right now, the one that makes the most sense, that's the best fit for all applications, is just the battery pack that you charge. Okay, well, no, I, I totally agree with you that it's not going to be a swappable battery. You need it for structural. But what about the induction? So would it be the feet? But you know, the feet are going to be just damaged because you're walking, you're always moving, and that's always going to be the scuff. You know, their shoes are always yeah. wrecked. Yeah. So would you wouldn't want to put anything sensitive down there? But induction charging, standing on a mat, people are talking about that. Is that possible? It, it's possible. Uh, but you know, the thing without induction charging is you have to be lined up pretty well to make sure you're there, which means the bot has to to look for the dance steps and mm -hmm. kind of step right there and stay there. Mm -hmm. And if it has to move, then, you know, maybe there's some other positions that also where the induction charging mat is going to be that it would go around. And then, you know, basically it's going to be like those, those dance steps that light up and say, Oh, move to here, move to there, get to yeah. the right position. So that might add a certain amount of complexity. And again, it adds more mass to the, the bottom of the bot, a little bit more cost, everything else. So it may or may not be advantageous, especially if the bot has to move a lot. So it's like comes over, stands on the mat for like 10, 15 seconds. Is that really worthwhile yeah. doing that when mm -hmm. it's not on there? Or are you going to have the whole floor with just a bunch of these dance steps that you keep on going down to be able to recharge it? Because remember, it's what's coming off the ground. You're going to be lined up right. You want to be close. You're adding additional mass. Um, I'm pretty sure the bot itself is going to be plugged in directly and not have like induction charging on the back. Well, that yeah. could be one possibility that backs up to the wall to charge like that without you having to plug in. But there's inefficiencies. There's, you know, 70 to 90%. Yes. I know Tesla bought a company that says, you know, it can do it for about 90%. But the, the thing about the induction is that once you get the current going in on the other side of the plate, it's AC. And now you take the AC and you have to convert it to DC, which yeah. means you have to have an yeah. inverter on the bot. And yeah. we don't want an inverter in the bot. We want the inverter actually off the bot because mm -hmm. we want the bot to charge just like your phone does in your e-bike. And that, mm -hmm. you know, the, the inverter, the thing that converts the AC to the DC is over here. It's not in my phone. And yeah. it's the same thing with the brick that you have for your laptop. It's not built in. So what we want to have is we want to have DC going in uh, to simplify the, the mass and the cost and everything else to the bot. So when you do the induction, you're adding a little bit of that additional complexity and infrastructure right. in the bot where you don't want it. But there will be 
counter arguments that will be persuadable, let's say persuasive for certain use cases. So yeah. um, while I'm kind of against it, you know, I'm not going to say everyone is wrong for even considering it because there I mean, are going to be Scott, places and eventually induction yeah. charging will get better. Yeah. Why not just sell like they did with the cyber truck, a, a cyber pack, and then he's just wearing a backpack for those that need that extra hour, you wear a mm -hmm. backpack. Why that not? could be a possibility too, is that, yeah. that, you know, that's kind of the, the swappable nature as well, is that you it just is, kind of have, have, have right. that, that, that is, that is easily swappable that you can somehow yeah. plug in and then swap that out really quickly to go ahead. Yeah. Th yeah. There could be a variety of solutions like that. You're right. Okay. Yeah, why not? Wonderful. That was fun. Thank you so much, Scott. That was uh thorough. We talked about it. You, you uh, squash some bugs or some FUD that was uh, brought out there. It's very powerful. It can work eight hour shifts for sure. It can work three shifts. That's the hardest part that you showed that, you know, you really thought through how the charging and so forth and you used the uh, first principle thinking. That was mm -hmm. fun. Thank you so much, Scott. Appreciate it. You're welcome, Herbert. Glad to be here again. All right. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.